If you are uh, with us online, welcome. So glad that you are with us this morning. Happy Easter to all of you. I'll add my voice to that. I am so grateful that you are here, so grateful you're a part of our celebration. Obviously, we've seen uh, people uh, act out the resurrection. We've sang about it. We've read about it. We've uh, had confetti cannons go off, all those wonderful things, because Easter, it is the high point of the Christian calendar. Easter, for those who are followers of Jesus, is the central act of God's redeeming work, of, of saving us, of making us his children. And I love the energy. I love the the uh, people gather together singing songs, but I also know, I recognize, for so many people, uh, Easter is that once or twice a year when we go to church. And, and sometimes the feeling is like, I'm a little bit like an outsider, or I'm not sure I know everything about it. So uh, we're in a series right now in the Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Mark, there are four New Testament biographies of Jesus. Mark is the second one. It's the shortest one. And chronologically, it was the first one to be written. Take a look at the Gospel of Mark. If you have a copy of the scriptures, you have it on your device. Mark, just like the name. It's named after the author who tells the narrative of Jesus' life from the perspective of one of Jesus' most key influential first followers, a man named Simon Peter. Mark chapter 16 is where we're at. It's the closing chapter of his biography. And if you're someone who at times feels like life doesn't make sense, you might find some value in Mark's closing chapter of the biography of Jesus. The reality is, no matter how strong our faith, the reality is, no matter how secure our walk with God is, there are times when life doesn't make sense. It was a breakfast on Friday morning with a friend of mine, actually a man who used to serve on our elder team here, an executive with a, uh, an IT company, and he moved, relocated to Nashville, Tennessee a few months ago. And at breakfast, as we were talking about how life was going, he just said, he was kind of sh uh, shaken, we were getting ready to pray, and I prayed for this over breakfast, but he said, the shooting last week in Nashville where three nine-year-olds were executed and three staff of the school, it's a Covenant Presbyterian Church, uh, Covenant Presbyterian School, Rock that community, a, a secure school where kids should be safe. You don't have to follow much news of the Tribune or the Daily Herald to realize that there were a dozen shot in Chicagoland in the last week. 17-year-old killed, multiple teenagers shot. And How does the world make sense? Uh, Banking turmoil, economic uncertainty, jobs, riff, you know, reduction in force. And some of you have experienced that. And man, yeah, we believe in Jesus, we celebrate this. But how do I celebrate Easter when life doesn't make sense? And, and I think the thing I appreciate so much about the Gospel of Mark, Mark's um, biography of Jesus, is that he leans in to the uncertainty. You see, we've had almost 2,000 years to celebrate Easter, to think through with historians, theologians, philosophers, what is the meaning of the resurrection? What does it mean for humankind? What does it mean for me as a follower of Jesus? His first followers didn't have that luxury of years. Like you and I in our day, they were living the moment. And like some of you, their life didn't make sense. For three years, some of them for three years had followed Jesus. He had claimed to be the Son of God, the one God would send to, to save people, to, to make right that which was wrong, to, as Jesus himself told the story, the sheep the, that are wandering, the children that are far away, he'll bring them back. And that first Easter Sunday morning, they only knew a corpse. That's the blunt word that Mark uses to describe what happened to Jesus on Friday. He's killed. His, his corpse, his body was placed in a tomb. Now, in Jewish culture, Friday night, it's beginning of the Sabbath. And so in good Jewish fashion, uh, they rested. In fact, there was sort of a rush to get Jesus off the cross and buried. And that's what took place. Mark 16, beginning in verse 1, sort of picks it up from there. When Sabbath was passed, we're now Saturday evening, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, uh, bought spices so they might go and anoint him. In Jewish culture, you didn't embalm, you didn't do anything like that. You simply would 
wash the body and then pack spices around so as the decay happens, the smell wasn't overwhelming and that hadn't happened because Friday night was just, it happened so quickly and dramatically. And so Saturday night, they, they go to the market, they do that. And it's interesting, by the way, that Jesus' disciples, the men who are disciples are scattered. They're not mentioned until later, but it's, it's those loyal, faithful women, not valued in that culture, who are the first witnesses to what we call Easter Sunday, the resurrection. So uh, verse 2, and very early on the first day of the week, so it's now Sunday morning, when the sun had risen, they, that is three, three women, went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, and here's the first of three experiences these first followers have as they're sorting out how life makes sense when you've been deeply disappointed or suffered a loss, or don't understand what's happening. The first thing they had was questions. What's going on? Am I up to this task? Do I have the resources? What if I don't understand? And that's all summarized in one question. Look at verse 3. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? It's a pretty practical question. The stone's heavy. Soldiers would have sealed the tomb by rolling a, a large stone disc of a stone into grooves and it would have sat there and you know what I'm talking about you have questions what's it mean what I'm going through when does life make sense when does it get better or for some maybe how does it get any better it's as good as it's going to be and in the quiet of the night we ask the big questions what difference does my life make what follows this life the Jesus first followers trying to sort it out they asked those same questions. Now look at verse 4. And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. No explanation for why, but this stone's out of the way. And beginning in verse 5, they moved to the second experience that. First, it's questions. What's happening? What's going on? How do I know? And how can I, how can I get through this? And Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. I'd say Jesus wasn't the young man sitting in the, in the, on the side of the, the shelf where his corpse had been laid. This was an angelic appearance. Here was an eyewitness bearing eyewitness testimony to what happened. And the women could see the evidence of an empty tomb and a stone rolled away. And I uh, love the end of verse 5. It, they were alarmed. Five times in this text, in these paragraphs, we're going to have synonyms for fear or terror or alarm. And look at the response of the angelic messenger. And verse 6, he said to them, do not be alarmed. Love that. It's a, it's a good word. If you're alarmed, you need to not be alarmed. And uh, look, look, at the, look at the eyewitness message. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. So far, yes and yes. We seek his body, and yes, he was crucified. That's why we're here. Now, what comes next is surprising. Not the words they expected to hear, not the way they thought this narrative would turn out. And He's risen. He's not here. Another piece of evidence. See, see the place where they laid him. You can almost imagine this angelic messenger uh, pointing at this low shelf where the bodies would be laid. Man, if you're one of those first followers, you should have known. Mark himself records in chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, that Jesus had said, hey, listen, listen, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to Jerusalem. There I'll be betrayed and tried and convicted and executed, but I'm going to rise again on day three. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it's day three. Still doesn't make sense. In this case, the first thing they dealt with were questions. The second is fears. In fact, uh, the words uh, repeated again, uh, verse 7, says, this is great news, go tell disciples and Peter, I love it that Peter influenced the, the writer, and, and it's like, and it's shout out to Peter, tell him too, and that he's going to be, uh, meet you in Galilee, he's going before you to Galilee, and there you'll see them, and it's here another reminder, just like he told you, what he said he'd do, he's done, uh, now go and let's get, about, uh, let's get on with life, and now look, look. I'm so grateful that the gospel writer Mark is honest. We tend to see saints carved out of marble in niches somewhere in a, in a cathedral. 
cold, perfect, and dead. That's not how it was. <laughs> and they went out and fled from the tomb. Trembling and astonishment had seized them. They said nothing. Wow. There's fear, <laughs> flight, and disobedience. Why? For they were afraid. Some of you know what this means. Sense of looming anxiety that so often courses through our culture in these uncertain times. For some, it's an unexpected turn in life, and you're, you're as they were, seized with terror. Frozen in fear, unable to sort of function and do the thing that you've been trained or called or equipped or educated to do. Uh, questions? Fear? It feels like they're reading the New York Times or Chicago Tribune. Verse 9, we have a note that this was kind of a follow-up, these these were added later and helped us understand what's going on. Look at verse 9. When Jesus arose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Uh, that, in all four of the gospel accounts, all four of the biographies of Jesus, it's Mary, one of Jesus' first followers, who is the first witness that Jesus himself appears to. Uh, verse 10, she went and told those who'd been with him as they mourned and wept. We saw some of that illustrated here this morning beginning of the service. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, what's that last phrase? They would not believe it. I don't know if it was frustration or the fear of being disappointed yet again, but they're like, no, we're not going to believe it. Verse 12, after these things, he appeared to another, uh, in another form to two of them. They were walking in the country. Here's a, a companion to Luke chapter 24, his the closing chapter of Jesus' biography tells the same story at more length. And they went back and told the rest, the rest of the disciples, but they did not believe them. <laughs> so, you have questions? You have fears? You have doubts? Yeah, welcome to being a human, per a human person. And, and you can believe and trust Jesus Christ. These were his followers and wrestle with questions and fear and doubt. But, but some, you wrestle with questions and fear and doubt, not as a follower of Jesus, but as someone who's new to that. Or as a child, I remember confirmation class or religious education or Sunday school, and, but it's been a long time, but you know, mom or dad talked you into coming to church today. And can I, let me just say a word to you. You will never have all the answers to life's questions. You're just not. Don't let that be the thing that stops you from trusting Jesus Christ. Even his closest followers wrestle with question and fear and doubt. But here's what I would say to you. The best answers are found in understanding the person of Jesus Christ. Knowing that we're created in the image of God for the purpose of relationship, for the purpose of making a difference in this world, relationship with God, relationship with one another, and the explanation for why we fall short again and again is our fallenness, our sin, not a part of the original plan, and yet God in his deep grace, what we celebrate here today, has built a bridge. He's reached out to us in the person of Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God, lived as we saw Good Friday, died and rose again. That that resurrection is God's stamp of approval on Jesus' substitution is taking our place as Savior. Let me give you maybe three takeaways from Easter Sunday. How do I celebrate Easter Sunday when life doesn't seem to make sense? First of all, Jesus is greater than my questions. Trust him. I don't know who's going to move the stone away for you. Here's the deal. You don't either. Fretting constantly about that probably does not get you to a better place in life. So we trust Jesus. A second, Jesus is greater than our fears. Trust him. Maybe you're picking a theme up. There, there are things about which you should be afraid. This is a fallen world. It's not heaven yet. There are uncertainties about the future. We, we have to give up the foolish notion that somehow we have control. We don't. 
That can drive fear, and fear can drive unhealthy behaviors. And you know what we need? We need to trust Jesus. And doubt. You can be a follower of Jesus for many years and wrestle with doubt. You can be someone who's just hearing about Jesus the first time and have doubt. Jesus is greater than doubt. And trust him. In fact, the, like the transformation took place when they recognized who Jesus was, when there was that personal interaction and faith in him. And uh, Let me illustrate it this way. We, Vicki and I, I, I've told you before, we bought an old rundown house about six months ago, and um, we did some work on it. In fact, guys, you want to, I think we have some, yeah, we, we have some uh, guys going to help me with the message here. We, um, thank you. We bought this house, and we have some wonderful plans for it, and one of the things we're doing is uh, kind of opening up, you know, open concept, because these old 60s ranch houses where everything was chopped up in these little, house, little rooms, and so, so we're taking down walls, and here's the thing, so I obviously work with our architect, and like when you take down a wall, you have to make sure the house doesn't fall down. You, we're good with that? And, and my wife, in particular, is very motivated that our house not fall down. I appreciate that, and so I wouldn't have picked the week of Easter, but a contractor became available, and he said, hey, uh, I can take down that wall and between your kitchen and your living room and open that up, and so, uh, yeah, right there, guys, thank you. Th this, um, it's called a header. Uh, th this is uh, 12 inches, uh, it it's two bys, but it there's two of them with some plywood in between, and you have these in your house, you do. Over every door and every window, you have headers. They're behind the walls. And if you take these out, your house will fall down. It will, because it's what supports the entire structure of the house the weight of the roof and the ceiling and, and the unsupported walls rests on this. In the same way, when it comes to your Christian faith, your, uh, your questions and, and maybe uh, your fear and uh, doubt, Th those are not going to get solved on your own. You can go to your grave with questions, and fear, and doubt. The entire superstructure of your life needs to rest on the person of Jesus Christ. And even as a follower of Jesus Christ, there will be times that you have questions or fears or doubts, but your life doesn't fall down because in the face of question and fear and doubt, Jesus is greater. His triumph over the grave proved God's acceptance of his act, his sacrificial act of death. His resurrecting from the dead is the, the promise of our own triumph over death. There is more to this life than this life. And uh, questions and fear and doubt are answered with trust. Just like I didn't see this header until they opened the wall, but I trusted. And we put back one even bigger than this. <laughs> Buried it up in the ceiling. It, when the drywallers are done, it'll, it'll also be invisible but in evidence because the house stands firm. Will you today, this Easter Sunday, trust Jesus Christ as Savior? Let me close by reading to you a quote from Timothy Keller. Keller, pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian, New York very astute cultural observer and critic, he writes this, and he writes from the place of battling terminal cancer, three years in, stage four, pancreatic cancer. Why is it so hard to face suffering? Why is it so hard to face disability and disease? Why is it so hard to do the right thing if it's going to cost you money, reputation, maybe even your life? Why is it so hard to face your own death or the death of a loved one? It's so hard because we think this broken world is the only world we're ever going to have. 
easy to feel as if this money is the only wealth we'll ever have, as if this body is the only body we'll ever have. But if Jesus Christ is risen, your future is so much more beautiful, so much more certain than that. It's the foundation. If you know that this is not the only world, the only body, the only life that you'll ever have, you'll someday have, that someday you'll have a perfect life, a real concrete life. Who cares what people do to you? You're free from the ultimate anxieties in this life so you can be brave and take risks. You can face the worst thing with joy and hope. The resurrection means that we can look forward with hope to the day our suffering will be gone. But it means even more than that. We can look forward with hope to the day that our suffering will be glorious when God makes it right in our own resurrection. All of that truth founded on the person of Jesus Christ. His resurrection we celebrate today. What I want to do is pray for you right now. Close this message by just praying for you. For some of you, it's a chance for you to commit your life to trusting Jesus Christ, to believe. For others, maybe you've done that and you're bearing the burdens or wrestling with questions or fear and doubt and it's time to trust him and turn those things over. Let's pray now. Father, thank you for the gospel writer Mark's honesty about how often we can struggle when life doesn't make sense. And also for the triumph of Jesus Christ over our questions, our fears, and our doubts. Lord, I pray for those here today who for the first time or maybe in a time of recommitment will trust that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Lived a perfect life, died a death on our behalf and rose again. Father, I pray for those who have believed that and walked the path of faith for many years, but whew, sometimes life doesn't make sense. Will you help us to trust, Lord, when we can't sort it out? Father, I pray that this church would always stand as a beacon of hope for people wherever they find themselves, whatever their backgrounds are, that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our life is not vain and our future is secure. Thank you for the annual reminder that Easter is, Lord. Help us to face this world today with the greatest hope we've ever had, the hope of Jesus Christ, in whose name we ask this and all God's people agreed by saying,